Well, good morning, New Story. Great to have you here. I'm glad that you're worshiping with us on this very special Sunday. Whether you're here in person or tuning in online, I'd like to welcome you to this place of worship together. My name is Stephen. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at New Story Church. And uh, I don't know about you, I was so blessed by our worship, uh, our worship time today. So can we just thank the Lord for our worship? And God really touched my heart just thinking of the lyrics that we sang together. Would you just bow with me as we begin our time together? Lord, we declare unto you how great you are. Um, you are a great God. You're the same God. And Father, we want to meet you. We want to encounter you today. Speak to our hearts as we open our hearts unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us to think about the most popular logos in the world. When we look at big companies out in the world, I mean, they spend a lot of money and a lot of energy and time to come up with their perfect logo uh, in such a way that when people actually look at that particular logo, nobody is, um, is, is, is lost in the, in the fact that what they actually stand for, the very essence of who they are and what they stand for. That's why they devote themselves to creating this perfect logo as well. So just for fun of it, I thought that might be good for me to show you some of these popular logos on the screen, and you tell me what company they are, all right? So um, got it? So you got to shout out uh, the company name to me. So here's the first one, okay? What is this? Nike. Nike. What's their tagline? Just do it. We all know it like you're our own phone number, right? We all know exactly what they stand for. And um, what athlete comes to your mind when you think about this particular logo? LeBron, <laughs> somebody say uh, Michael Jordan. I mean, it's different generation and stuff. But uh, uh, you think about the best of the best athletes when you think about this logo. As a matter of fact, Nike is a Greek word for victory. So when actually look at this logo, they want you to think about the winner, the champions of the world as well. Here's the next logo. What is this? Apple. What do you think about when you look at this logo? Okay iPhone, uh, iPad, uh, Apple Watch, uh, the laptop, all that. They stand for technology, innovation, creativity like none other, okay? That's what they stand for. Here's the next logo. What is this? McDonald's, right? What do you think about when you look at this logo? <laughs> Fries, okay? Big Mac, you know, soft serve. Um, well, this is actually a true story. Uh, years back, actually, I went to McDonald's, and then I actually got my favorite menu, which is a, a crispy chicken sandwich. And I was hungry, and I took my first bite, and I couldn't believe it. There I saw a piece of hair. It was brown hair. It's a brown curly hair. I couldn't believe it. I grew up eating McDonald's all my life, and I couldn't believe it. I never, it never happened to me before. So actually, I took it to the manager and showed to her see what I found in the sandwich, and she couldn't believe it. She said she worked in the store for more than 10 years. This never happened to her in her life. Uh, well, she took it to the back crew and then showing what happened here, and nobody says, this is not me, this is not me. Anyway, she was so nice, so apologetic. She gave me a, a full refund and a brand new sandwich. But you know what? I, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't eat it anymore. So that is what comes to my mind when I look at this particular logo, uh, when I look at the, an advertisement as well. Here's one more. What is this? Tesla. Why, wow, the little kid knows that it's Tesla. <laughs> That's the power of logo that we're talking about. This is a brand uh, company for um, EV industry that we all know that most popular car during the pandemic as well. Regardless how you feel about all these companies, one thing that you cannot deny is that all these companies changed our world drastically in our lives. In the athletic world, in technology, in fast food business, in the EV industry, they radically transform our world and our lives. But I want to let you know that there is another logo that's far more powerful than any other the logos combined all together. And do you know what that is? That's right. It's this logo. Cross, 2,000 years ago, when the church was born and began to spread like a wildfire, immediately the church actually incorporated this particular symbol to be their corporate symbol, the cross. 
The amazing thing is because this is not anything of beauty or creativity. This is a two pieces of wood stuck together. This actually was not a symbol of any hope. This was a symbol of judgment and curse. This is a symbol of torture when criminals went to die. But when Jesus died on the cross, this changed everything. It is no longer a symbol of death, but a symbol of life. Not a symbol of judgment, but a symbol of forgiveness. For the last 2,000 years, this has become the most worldwide recognized logo in human history. You can go anywhere in the world, you look at this logo, you know exactly what that represents. It represents Christ. It represents Christianity. It represents the church. This logo, more than any other logo in the world, has radically transformed our world and our lives because what Jesus has done on the cross. What's the message behind this logo? The central message behind the cross is that God loves you. God accepts you. God forgives you. God wants to heal you. And God wants to give you a new life. And that is the message behind this logo that transformed our lives. I grew up in the church, and as far as I remember, I went to church all my life. But there's a time and moment in my life during my middle school years when God became a lot personal and real to me. God invaded my heart like none other. That's when I knelt down and, and surrendered my life to Jesus, and I began to follow him. It was a little campsite called Camp Colby. It was a totally terrible place to, you know, stay there. But God spoke to me. God met me there. That's when I made a decision to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Maybe you had a similar experience when Jesus showed up in your life. When you had to lay down all your pride, all your uh, fears and anxieties, inadequacies and shame and guilt, and simply surrender your life to Jesus, that's when you decide to follow Jesus. Then you, that's when you started the journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, we celebrate the great baptisms of 24 people out in, uh, at the beach. T, uh, these individuals are great individuals. They want to really let people know, the whole world know, they want to follow Jesus. The question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And that's exactly what we're trying to unpack here in our series called Following Jesus, the Life of a Disciple. I mean, this is incredibly important, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, that we all need to look at our lives and see where we are in following Jesus in our discipleship journey. As a matter of fact, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus started his earthly ministry, the first thing that he did, the first thing that he did was that he chose his disciples. One day, he walked up to a handful of men, and he made this statement. He said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they dropped their nets, everything, and they began to follow Jesus. A radical transformation. Well, Luke's gospel gives a little bit more detail from his perspective. So if you have a Bible with you, turn your Bible with me to Luke chapter 5, and there we're going to find out what it means to follow Jesus. Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 1. It says this, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, which is Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. The passage starts with the phrase, one day. This is no special day. This is another ordinary day. But an ordinary, can, ordinary day can turn into an extraordinary day when Jesus shows up in your life. Do you see how he actually came closer and closer to Peter's life? Think about all these action steps that Jesus took to get closer to Peter's life. 
Jesus was standing by the lake. He saw Peter. He came to Peter. He got into Peter's boat. He sat down in Peter's boat and he spoke to Peter. That's the story of God's love. He comes to you. He didn't stay up in heaven. He actually came down to earth. He came down, down to your city. He came down to your neighborhood. He came down to your house. He was he's sitting in your, in your couch, in your living room. He comes close to you. That is what the gospel is all about. Jesus comes to you. Jesus comes to your life. Jesus comes to your heart. Jesus comes to you with the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is that I love you. I love you. I love you. Our God is the one who reaches out. When God shows up in your life, you will never be the same. And that's exactly what happened to Peter. Look at verse 4. When he had finished speaking, when Jesus um, finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now think about this. Jesus was done with his sermon. He was done with his teaching with the crowd, but he was not done with his ministry to Peter and the, and the handful of men there. I want you to know that there's a difference between word of God, hearing the word of God, and word from God. Okay, you're here at New Story Church. You're sitting together. You're watching. You're actually hearing the word of God from Scripture. But there's another thing for you to understand that God can speak to you directly and personally, and that is not just word of God, but word from God with your name on it. You may be sitting next to your family members or your friends in the same chapel, and yet you are so convicted and moved, whereas other people next to you are not. See, God could speak to you personally and directly and intimately far beyond what is shared from the pulpit, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And God can speak His Word, and that's Word from God. You understand that Peter had his day. Andrew, his brother, has had his day. And this could be your day and my day as we open our hearts to Jesus and what He has to speak to us. See, when God shows up in your life, you will never be the same. And so today, as we examine Peter's day of transformation, I want us to see what leads us to follow Jesus as a disciple? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Five simple points that I want you to remember. Here's one. Following Jesus starts with the humble recognition of your limits. Let me repeat that. Following Jesus starts with humble recognition of your limits. Verse 5, Simon Peter said this. Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. See, Jesus showed up in Peter's life at a very low point when he was very tired, when he was very discouraged. Have you ever gone through a day like that? You work hard. You work really hard and you're exhausted. You're tired. But somebody comes to you and tells you something to do. Maybe that's the story of your life. Maybe you work hard for all your life for your company to really succeed. But at the end, you realize that there's nothing there. You work hard for your job, and yet you are not getting any better. You're not getting promoted. You nothing there. You're busy raising up your children as much, as hard as you can. But after so many years, there's nothing there. You serve the Lord so faithfully, so for many decades, but you look at it and it says, there's nothing there. That could be so disheartening and very discouraging. That's exactly where Peter was when he hit his limits. He understood his limits. That's when Jesus showed up and told Peter to do something ridiculous. Ridiculous. I mean, if I were to be Peter, I would say, forget it, Jesus. I mean, I'm tired. Don't bother me. I am done with fishing for today. Don't bother me. That's, that's, that would be my, my attitude. As a matter of fact, what Jesus was asking them to do was such a dumb idea in the eyes of fishermen. This is fishing 101. You don't go fishing during the daytime. All the people, all the fishermen at Sea of Galilee knew exactly when to go fishing for a great catch. 
You go at night. When the fish actually come on the surface and closer to the shore, that's when you go out to fish. But Jesus, in daytime, they actually get scared. They actually, because sunlight is hitting the water, they don't want to be around. So that's not the best time to go fishing. It's a very simple, basic, common sense. And yet Jesus said, go out. Go for a catch. As a matter of fact, Peter was the one who's fisherman, not Jesus, right? He, Jesus was a carpenter by trade. What does a carpenter know about fishing? I would be so offended if I were to Peter. Peter had every reason not to listen to Jesus. But what's remarkable about Peter is that he simply obeyed. Verse 5, Simon Peter said, Master, we've worked hard all night haven't caught anything, but listen to this, because you say so. Church, repeat after me. Because you say so. Because you say so. That's what Peter said. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. Here's the point number two about following Jesus. Following Jesus means simple obedience to his word. Here, Peter makes it very clear that he would obey simply, even though it makes no sense to him. He would simply obey because Jesus said so. That was a turning point of his life. Even though that uh, makes no logical sense, Jesus, I will trust you. God, I will trust and I will obey. Peter simply submitted himself to the authority of God's word. That's what following Jesus really means. Uh, many, many years ago when I had small children, very small children, one of my sons actually um, kind of was, was learning. He's about three years old, nameless, uh, but three years old, and he's actually learning to speak. And he had this one kind of a phrase that he loved to do. Is, uh, he, would, he would ask me, pointing certain items, what's this? Oh, and I said, this is paper. And uh, he would actually follow up with another question. says, how do you know? I mean, you know, and he says it with an attitude. Like, how do you know? Uh, it's paper. I mean, uh, I thought it was cute, you know, and a three-year-old little kid. And, you know, and, and, and then actually, um, and he says again and again. He says, oh, whatever, you know. And then he keeps on saying it, saying it every single item that he sees. What's this? It's this, this book. How do you know? So it, uh, it's so annoying after, after so many times, you know? Cuteness is gone. It's kind of annoying and stuff. So, uh, you know, I know, you know, and all that. And then, you know, one time we were actually having, you know, dessert after um, dinner. And here he goes again, you know, says, what's this? And I said, that's watermelon. And he says, how do you know? Hee <laughs> hee. And he says, it's watermelon. And then he points another one and says, what's this? And I said, that's strawberry. And he said, how do you know? Man, I didn't have a good day that day. And I just couldn't hold it in anymore. Because, folks, I know my fruit. Some people grew up having all kinds of ice cream after dinner. I didn't grow up after having ice cream after dinner. I grew up having all kinds of fruit after dinner. I know my fruit. And this little kid is asking or questioning my intellectual ability to name the fruit. And I just had it. So I said, Jonathan, uh, I am, I'm your daddy and your daddy knows everything. Not the proudest moment as a father. But you know what? It worked. He stopped asking the question anymore. So he didn't ask me that question anymore. Um, but you know what? You and I ask the same question to our Heavenly Father all the time. You lost your job. You got hospitalized. You go to the scripture and God says, do not worry. Do not fear. I'll take care of you. And you know what? Underneath our breath, we said, how do you know? We say with the same attitude. Prove it to me that you're right and, and I could trust you. I'll take care of you. How do you know? I will provide. My name is Jehovah Jireh. 
And we say the same thing to our Heavenly Father. How do you know? Prove it. Oftentimes, we do not want to obey. We're doubtful. We're skeptical. We question God all the time. How do you know? But Peter didn't ask that question. Instead, he simply said yes to Jesus. When they obeyed, they saw something they've never seen before. They saw a miracle of God. Look at verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Do you understand this moment of miracle that they witnessed? When you simply obey Jesus, watch out because God is going to give you a miracle that you've never seen in your life. You're about to experience God in a different light and different measure. So the real blessing here in this story is not a large catch that they had. It's not the miracle. The real blessing in Peter's life is that he got a fresh look on who Jesus is. Here's number point number two. Following Jesus leads you to a deeper discovery of who God is. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at, his, at, Jesus', um, at Jesus knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Do you realize that Peter actually called Jesus master in verse 5 before the miracle? And master is a very uh, common term, term of respect. Sir, it might be a good kind of a, a word for us to think about. But and yet after the miracle, he didn't call him sir. He didn't call him master. He called him Lord in verse 8. His perspective on Jesus changed drastically from just a rabbi to Messiah. You're my Lord. You're my everything. You're my number one. You own me, Jesus. That's exactly where he was, and that's what he wanted to express with his heart of worship. Peter knew about Jesus all this time, but didn't really know Jesus. He discovered that Jesus was not just a rabbi, but the Lord, the Messiah. It's up until now, Jesus was just, he was just a fan of Jesus, but now he has become a follower of Jesus. When you encounter God and see a glimpse of His glory and His holiness, you also see the dirt in your life, how dirty you are. That's why, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And then Jesus said to Simon, verse 10, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That leads us to point number four. Following Jesus really helps you to find a new purpose in life. New purpose in life. Remember, Simon just had the greatest catch in his lifetime. He caught more fish in one day than ever before. And humanly speaking, this is time to retire. This is time to go on a vacation. You could just go out and buy a yacht or something. But no, his eyes are not looked. Uh, it's not on the fish that they just caught. But he was thinking and looking for something bigger than himself. See here, Jesus is calling him to live for something more than just stinky fish that he, they just caught that's going to die and that's going to be nothing after so many weeks. Jesus gave him a new vision, new calling, new purpose. Peter, you were not born to catch the fish, but you're born to catch people. Fishers of men. See, what Jesus saw at that particular time is not who Peter was at the Sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 5, but who Peter could become down the road, the apostle, the one that would actually stand before people to proclaim Jesus in the book of Acts. When Jesus sees you today in 2022, he doesn't see you as you are today, but he sees you who you can become five years down the road, 10 years from from now, 20 years from now, what you can do in your life, through your life, the new purpose. 
And God is telling all of us that I created you, I made you to live for something far bigger than yourself. Don't settle for less. You are born for something much bigger than getting a paycheck. You're born for something much bigger than building your company. You're born for something much bigger than just feeding your children. You're born for something much bigger than just making money and living comfortably for the rest of your life. God created you for something far greater than your own personal fulfillment and happiness. God has placed you on earth for a purpose, and that is to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, as we heard last week from Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Whatever you do, God is calling you to be all in, fully devoted follower of Christ. And whatever you do in your life, what kind of an industry, what kind of a business, wherever you are, you have to live your life under the canopy of the Great Commission and see how your life intersects with God's story. And that's where you actually find the meaning and purpose in your life. See, many Christians misunderstand this concept of discipleship. Many Christians think that, well, I just need to grow. I need to go to Bible study. I need to grow, and I need to just learn, 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 and be big and mature. No, I mean, that's part of it, but that's not everything. The end picture of discipleship is that you become fishers of men. It's never inward focus. It's always outward focus. It's always missional. It's not about me knowing God. That is important, but being on the mission together with God. And there's a purpose. Life turns a different meaning as you begin to see your life. So following Jesus is to be changed by Jesus and yet also be committed to his mission together. Some years ago at our church, and I, I spoke that Sunday, and I preached that Sunday, and after the message was, after the service was done, there was a young lady, young mom actually came up to me with an infant baby in her arms and just uh, introduced herself to me and greeted me and says, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, do you remember me? And it says, gosh, you know, I, you know, I, I don't. I, just remind me where I know you. And she said, uh, you know, um, I was a third, grader, third grade student when your children's pastor. Uh, this is like in the 90s, right? Um, and now she's a mom. So, oh, yeah, I remember you. You're kind of a little quiet and shy. And I remember you, the retreats that we went to together. I remember you. And uh, she actually told me, um, I don't know whether I told you this or not, but uh, you led me to Christ during that time. It just gave me so much joy and gratitude and humility about, yeah, really, just tell me about it. And now you're a mom with a baby. That's awesome. And then she told me that me and my husband got married a few years ago, and now we're serving as missionaries on the mission field. And, you know, I came home on cloud nine. I mean, that's, that matters everything. That, that just gives me a great perspective what God can do. Soon after I came to know Christ in the middle school, um, there was a brother who somehow took me under his wings with a few other people, and he really discipled me for two years. Um, the formative years of my Christian faith, uh, he, he took me around a lot of places. We went to the retreat side. We, you know, a lot of places that we went that we, we, we learned to follow Jesus together. Um, to be honest with you, I don't even know where he is. I don't even have his contact information now. I lost touch with him after all these years. But I remember him. And what he did during that time in my middle school days is that he invested in me. He discipled me in such a way that I could pass on to other people to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, that make disciples on and on and on. Whatever he did during that time made an eternal impact, not only in my life, but so many other people's lives. Especially this service, I know we have so many volunteers and leaders who are serving in the next-gen ministry, whether youth ministry and children's ministry. I just want to thank you so much for all that you do. This is a great opportunity that you can invest in something that you may not know today, but it will bear fruit many years to come. 
the thing that you do, the, 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 the investment that you're making in these little children's lives could reap harvest beyond your imagination. And you would feel exactly what I felt when I interacted with the lady who came forward and introduced herself. And that's going to change your perspective as well. So that is our calling to invest in other people, young and old, that we could make disciples and make disciples and make disciples and make disciples. And that's the bigger purpose. I'm living for something far more than my comfort. I'm living for God's kingdom and his mission agenda as well. Maybe some of you here need to take the step. Maybe you're so self-centered. You're all about yourself all this time. Maybe God is calling on you. Live for something far bigger than yourself. Living large that you would live for God's mission in your life. That leads us to the fifth and last point about following Jesus. That demands total surrender. Total surrender. Verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. Verse 11. Peter and his friends left everything to follow Jesus. And no turning back and no turning back. They left their nets. They left their boats. They left their friends. What is there for you to leave behind to follow Jesus? What are the competitors in your life that usually take the center of your attention in your life? These are good things in your life. Nets are nothing bad. Boats are nothing bad. Friends are nothing. But they can actually become your idol and your life focus. And Jesus said, will you drop everything and be able to live on my mission as well. Maybe your dream, maybe your diploma, maybe your resume, maybe your bank account, maybe your children, maybe your parents, maybe your marriage or relationship that you have. Whatever it is, when Jesus becomes your number one, you will open up your hands and surrender the treasures of your life back to God. And that's what total surrender means. That total surrender doesn't mean a sense of resignation. It says, I'm not going to do anything or God will take care of me, so I I surrender. No, that's not biblical total surrender. Total surrender really means in the scripture is that you abandon your agenda for God's agenda. Do you understand that? It's not you're just kind of taking a nap or just doing nothing and just sit back and... No, it is you're engaging God's agenda instead of your own agenda. You relinquish, you abandon, you release your hands for your own goals and dreams. And God, give me a new dream. Give me a new purpose. I want to live for you. And that is what total surrender is all about. We're living in the world of social media. And we use the term following very loosely and so casually. I follow you on Instagram. That means that, you know, I know what you're doing. I know what you're eating, who you're hanging out with. You know, I know a glimpse of your life. That's why we you often use that. I'm following you on Instagram. I know enough about you to know about you. Well, that is our concept of following in our generation. That is completely opposite from what Jesus was mentioning when he says, follow me. He's not talking about follow me on Instagram. No. He is saying that, Will you follow me? Would you go all in and follow me? Even all the way to the cross, will you be able to follow me? People think that they are followers of Christ because they come to church. They have a Bible in the house. They hang out with church friends. No, that's not what the definition of following Jesus really means. You may be a, a fan of Jesus, but not a follower of Jesus. There's a difference between a fan and a follower. Jesus is not about fans. He's not interested in fans. He's interested in followers. Jesus had a lot of fans. The crowd of people were just following him, listening to great sermon, listening to the great message all the time, but they're not willing to Follow him like Peter did. I've been reading about just the the climate of the church, the big church of our generation. 
what the pandemic has done to our church is that uh, this pandemic has generated so many fans of Jesus instead of the followers of Jesus. Uh, you, you could come whenever you want to. If you want to devote yourself whenever you want to. I mean, do whatever you want to do. Just, you could just kind of uh, from a distance, you could watch Jesus do what he does. And I'll just follow Jesus like on Instagram. No. No. Jesus actually wants us to be devoted followers. We don't want to sit in the stands. We want to play the game. We want to join Jesus and be able to get involved with his mission. I want you to see all these five points that I listed here, what it means to follow Jesus. Humble recognition of your limits. Simple obedience to God's word. A deeper discovery of who God is. A new purpose in life. And total surrender. I want you to know that discipleship journey is not just for a portion of your life. It's not only when you first came to know Christ in your junior high days or you know, college days. No. Uh, following Jesus, discipleship journey is for the rest of your life. And these five themes about following Jesus will be repeated over and over again in your life. As a matter of fact, this same episode takes place in John chapter 21 after Jesus rose from the dead. After he resurrected, this actually same episode is really repeated in Peter's life at the same location. Why? Because Jesus is bringing them back to what it means to follow Jesus in the first place is repeated in their lives all the way through. Peter experienced so many limits in his life. Many times he felt like he failed Jesus. But that's when he found out who Jesus really was in a new sight. I don't know exactly where you are in your spiritual journey. Maybe you're a new Christian. Maybe you've been walking as a child of God or following Jesus for 20 years or 30 years. We're all in the same boat that we're all growing and, and becoming followers of Jesus in our own lives. But whenever you encounter these five points... God's become number one again. God's going to be elevated in your life again. You begin to realize that you need to submit yourself and give yourself to Jesus to follow him faithfully. And I pray that that would be the radical transformation that you experience in your life. Not only today, but for the rest of your life. Would you bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for the way that you loved Peter. Man had no vision and purpose in his life other than catching fish at the Sea of Galilee. And you turned his life around 180 and he became a devoted follower of Christ. Lord, if there's anybody in this room that feels a little stagnant, spiritually, personally, just in life. Would you wake us up spiritually, cause us to see a new light of who you are when we face our limits, when we understand that there are things in our lives that we are not in control of. And when we do that, Lord, we want to surrender unto you. We want to be living for something larger than ourselves. It doesn't matter how old we are, doesn't matter where we are in our spiritual journey. We could all make a difference for you, for your kingdom. So Lord, would you open our hearts to follow after you right now in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.